Hi, Peter Charles here of Hooked for Life Fly Fishing. And I thought today, let's have a, a chit-chat about fly reels, uh, specifically trout reels. Uh, I mean, if we're getting into the business, you want to buy a reel or two or three, you want to buy some spools, or there's a number of things that goes into the decision. Plus, there's some just the aesthetics of the reel itself, how it works, whether it appeals to you, whether you like traditional stuff or you don't. All these kinds of things that go in. Some people like clickers, some people don't. So I'm thinking, you know what, let's have a little chat about reels, maybe talk about some of the stories I've got associated with some of these reels, and uh, talk about some of the reels I used to own and no longer own, and uh, sort of just get an idea of you know, trout reels in general, uh, and sort of get a bit of a flavor, if you will. Well, my first reel that I bought, uh, this would have been with my paper route money when I was a teenager, it was a horrible cast reel. It had no clicker, it just free spooled. And it had a cage on it, and the cage was off center. It, the spool wobbled as it turned. I mean, it was horrible. It looked like it had been cast under a dim light by a bunch of monkeys. It was brutally bad. Uh, because I was fishing off of a bank all the time, I would strip line in. Of course, the, the line would end up around my feet and um, tangled in the grass and all that kind of stuff. So I thought, you know what, I'll get an automatic reel. So, you know, you wind those up and when you press the lever, it pulls the line in. Cool. Except when I went to use it, I found out it wasn't so cool. Uh, it didn't solve my problem at all. Now, automatic reels are good under certain circumstances, but, you know, you'll, you don't see any automatic reels today for a good reason. So uh, my first two reels were both bad choices. Now the reels I've got in front of me today are uh, reels that are higher value. These run from, oh, mid-range up to uh, fairly high up in the price bracket, but I've used a lot of budget reels too. Um, I've used reels put out by Echo and they've been quite satisfactory, no problems there. I have used reels uh, put out by British Fly Reel. Uh, these are simple cast reels and they've been quite durable and quite good as well. In fact, uh, my son is now using some of my old BFR reels that I bought 20 something years ago, uh, even longer actually, so more like 25 years ago, and he's still using them, he's still got them today and they still work just fine. So uh, you can have some old reels, I mean I've got upstairs a, systems, a, a scientific angler system one uh, reel is more in the salmon bass range and um, it's a great reel I love it uh, so a lot of those old cast reels are quite adequate so I'm going to be talking about more mid to high end reels but you know the reality is you, you can get a perfectly serviceable cast reel that'll do the job so if you're on a budget you know uh, and we're talking about money now you don't have to spend four or five hundred dollars on a trout reel if you're spending that kind of money on a trout reel, it's because you want that reel. Uh, if you, any of you are into photography, you'll know about Leica, and Leica costs five, six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars just for the camera body. Uh, and you don't buy a Leica because it's ten thousand dollars better than an Icon. It isn't. You're buying it for the aesthetic, and that's what we do with some of our fly reels. Plus, there's some practical reasons too. So let's look at what I've got here. Uh, let's start off with this little guy here. This is uh, J. Alstom Forbes Thistle. Uh, it's really a three weight size reel. It, you know, it's got a fairly wide spool, so it looks like it would uh, handle a lot of line. It doesn't. And I found that out the hard way. I bought this in Pennsylvania when I was fishing F Penn's Creek, and I wanted a fly reel for my bamboo rod, but I hadn't brought the bamboo rod with me, which was mistake number one. If I brought the bamboo rod with me, I would have realized this was too small a reel. But when I'm looking at it in the shop, I had a choice between this reel and a slightly larger one, uh, and uh, I second-guessed myself into the small one. So now it's my three-weight reel, and I use it um, uh, on my uh, three-weight rod. Just no problem at all. Fits fine, balances the rod, fits the line, no trouble. But that's a perfect example of, you know, looking at a reel and going, oh, it should work, and really having no way to judge. This particular reel here is a, a hardy featherweight. This is, I think, about the third featherweight I've owned. Um, this one is, was not made in England. The other two were. But you'll notice 
the cage for the reel extends over the spool. So this is not a palming ring here. This is fixed. So if you catch a large fish with this style of reel, it's pretty awkward to put pressure because there's no drag on it. It's just a clicker. Now you do have the ability to, uh, you know, adjust here. You've got this little adjustment knob. You can put a bit more pressure uh, with the clicker if you wanted to, but it isn't really a drag. So it's really a small to medium sized trout reel. It's not, I wouldn't use this on the Bow River where I could get into a 20 inch rainbow, which would run into the current. That would get to be an adventure. But you know, your average small stream trout, this would be perfectly adequate. Now this beastie is where we get into some serious money. This is a copy of a, well, it's not, I should say it's a copy. It is a Hardy Perfect, but it's, it's a current model. Um, it's not one of the old, you know, 100 year old ones. Uh, the design is 100 years old uh, of the Hardy Perfect, but they are now making brand new machined versions. The old ones were cast and uh, they're not cheap. I bought this, you know, because it, it was a good deal. It was, I bought it used, but it was like it was brand new. The guy never used it. I don't think he'd ever put a line on it. So, I, hey, I'll take it off your hands. And um, it happens to fit my bamboo perfectly. So I made up for this mistake here <laughs> by buying the perfect. But I mean, I, it's the aesthetic. I mean, f from a functional reel, it has the same problem as the uh, little um, uh, featherweight is that you can't really uh, control it very well if you've got a running fish. Now, I realized the big perfects back 100 years ago were catching huge salmon on them. Uh, and you know, there was no real drag and people had to figure out how to put pressure on the fish and they did it. I know it's possible, but I'm just saying, you know, from practical, uh, purposes, again, it's, I wouldn't look at this as being a big fish reel. It's, it's for your average trout and it works just fine. Now this little guy is a really old, um, Orbis CFO and this was made by Hardy. In fact, if we look at the back, you'll see it says made in England. There we go. We can get it there. You see made in England. So this was made by Hardy. Um, they originally they were cast and, um, later they were uh, machined. And, um, I really, really, really like this reel. I, I got, had a lot of CFOs over the years. They're a wonderful trout reel. Click and Paul only. You can get a disc version. Um, they do exist. Uh, they made them both versions. They had CFO, regular CFO and regular CFO disc. Great trout reel. Love the things. Um, I've, oh, I've had a CFO of, I've usually often had more than one. Uh, my son, my son ended, ended up with one of mine. Uh, and, um, the others disappeared when I became pro staff. You know, if I'm pro staff with a company that has reels, I can't go very well taking competitors on the water. Otherwise, I would have never gotten rid of them. Uh, so one of the downsides of becoming pro staff, by the way. So uh, a lot of my old CFOs are gone, but I still have that one, and I love it, and uh, it gets a lot of use. Uh, another one in the list is this, uh, you know, Hardy Ultralight Disc. This is the only one of my old reels that is, I'll turn it the right way around, one of my old reels that is uh, actually has a disc drag on it. Uh, and this would be uh, a combination of my big trout, big river, smallmouth bass, you know, getting into the bass territory um, type of fishing. And, you know, it's, it's perfectly serviceable as a trout reel. I love the thing. It's listed as a six, but a lot of the old reels, especially the old hardies, the rating number on them usually was optimistic. So, for example, I had a... a a marquee uh, 8.9 that I used on my, um, and I also had a 10 as well, a marquee 10, that I used on the seven weight rod. I put a seven weight line on it. So that get, kind of gives you an idea where I was going with it. It was perfectly adequate with a seven weight line. The 10 would have taken an eight, but the, an eight on the 8.9 was starting to push it when it comes to the amount of backing you had. And if you're fishing for steelhead with a clicker reel, you better have some backing, you know, or in my case, I've got some, I think I've got one picture, I'll put it up, uh, of me uh, fishing for uh, Chinook salmon, Great Lakes Chinook salmon, with that clicker marquee. So, 
you know, you better have some dra uh, some backing because you don't have a drag. So, you know, I, I, this is another kind of reel I really love. You know, I also had the non-disc version the, called JLH, which is exactly the same reel but without the disc drag. Same idea as the CFO. You had a version without and a version with. And I like both and I've used both. And I've caught tons of fish on them. Now, the bottom ones here are my uh, Danielsons. And these are a perfect example of a modern reel. So the top row are all my old reels. Some of them are not old in terms of years, but they're old in terms of design. Um, this one's about 20. This one's about 8. That one's about 5. That one is about 30. And that one's about 20-something. So, I mean, this row is old. The, this bottom row here, uh, my Danielsons, are classic new reels. In, in their large arbor, uh, the disc drags are sealed down to 20 atmospheres, so you can dunk this thing in water and not worry about it at all. Very smooth drags, no clickers, they're silent. A lot of people like silent reels. I'm, you know, either way, I don't care. Um, I'll go either way with it. Some of my reels are silent, some of them are not. So, you know, the advantage of large arbor, of course, is one turn of the crank picks up a lot of line. And when you're talking running fish and they're coming towards you, that's a good thing. Also, they tend to not coil up the line too much. I mean, this little, um, this little fella right here, boy, does it create coil coils. Because the arbor is so small, the spool is so small, that the, your line comes off looking like a slinky. So the beauty of using you know, reels like this is that the, uh, you know, the line comes off in large coils. No problems at all with uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it's, you know, the the one thing is they are much larger. I mean, this one here is a four seven. Okay, it should give you the breakdown. That's a two six, a four seven, and a five eight. The four seven and five eight are the same frame, just different size spools. So I can swap these spools around. So though this is a four seven frame, I can put a five eight spool on it, no trouble, which is handy. So. That's a 2.6. That means from 2.8 to 6.8. Get <laughs> about 6.8. It's not going to fit. Uh, I use this as a 4-weight reel, uh, and it works just fine with 4-weight lines. The 4.7, I think of as being a 5-weight reel, and, and that's all my 5-weight lines go on them, and I use my fair feet as a 6-weight reel. And it, they balance the rods just fine, too, uh, with that configuration. So it's no problem there from balance, no problem from capacity. You've got adequate backing if you need it, if you're after running fish that run. And uh, you've got really good drags, which are sealed. Uh, I, and when I get into subsequent videos, because I'm going to get into saltwater and I'm going to get into uh, salmon and steelhead as well, and bass, is the idea of a sealed drag for some of these fish starts to get important. Uh, I have used uh, unsealed drags for years, and the only time I've had a problem uh, was in the salt with one drag where the carbon disc on it just started to go to powder and powdered carbon is like a lubricant so you went from having a drag to having like a greased ball bearing instead of a drag it was pretty brutal um, I've also run into problems with cheap drags uh, I had a cheap drag cheap reel on a bass rod I'm fishing for smallmouth I hook a, a large carp and um, it runs me deep into my backing and the drag heated up so badly that I could hardly turn the reel to retrieve the fish. It cooled off after, enough for me to get the fish in and I did land it. But I mean, it was a lesson that if you're going after running fish, you better have a, a reel with a, a decent drag. And when I say decent, I mean quality. Uh, I remember talking to a store uh, a manager, a uh, fly shop manager, years ago. Uh, the shop has been closed about, about 10, 15 years now in downtown Toronto. And he ran tests where he put a bunch of backing on a reel uh, and then, you know, applied the drag and then put a um, electric motor that wound the backing back, spun the reel real fast, then measured the temperature and some of them got ridiculously hot. And if they get ridiculously hot, they'll fail, which is what happened to me. It got ridiculously hot and it failed. So if you're going after fish that run, you can look at something like 
uh, a Danielson with its uh, excellent drag, or there are plenty of other reels on the market that got excellent drags too. I'm not saying just Danielsons, lots of them do. Or you can go for a challenge and go for these click and pull reels and, and just, you know, have to do it the old fashioned way, palm the rim. And a lot of people believe in that. A lot of people own reels like these uh, Danielsons, and even despite they have a disc drag, they still palm them. Use the, because these do come with a palming rim and they will palm them and rather than use the disc drag and the, using the disc drag just to prevent overspooling and nothing else. And I've done that myself a lot of times. So, you know, just because you have a disc drag on the reel doesn't mean you have to use it. You can use the palming ring and just use the drag just to provide enough resistance that it doesn't overspool. And that works perfectly fine as well. So there's some thoughts about trout reels. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money on a trout reel. Simple cast reels will work just fine. And um, if you're spending more money, it's because you want to, because you like the reel, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I've got a, I can't talk, I've got a Hardy Perfect in here, you know, and some of these others aren't cheap either. So, you know, I prefer, the, you know, nicer reels, and I can afford them, so I do. But, uh, you know, if you want to go out for a basic reel, as I say, I've used basic reels for years, and um, except for that first one, which was brutally bad. All the others have been decent. Uh, the only problem I've ever had was with that running carp, and that's when the, ba the, the cheap reel taught me a lesson. You know, don't go after big fish that run with a cheap reel. You'll be sorry. And don't take them to the salt either. <laughs> You'll be sorry. Anyway, there's my trout reels. Cheers.